It was October of 1942, and the Guadalcanal campaign in the Pacific Theater had devolved into a brutal deadlock. Both the Japanese and the U.S. forces could not push their adversaries off the region, and each side kept pouring more men and equipment into the lethal stalemate. After Japan took USS Enterprise out of action weeks prior, the U.S. lost naval superiority in the region. However, the Americans still had air superiority, thanks to the capture of Henderson Field. Everything boiled down to that airbase. If the Japanese could recapture it, they would be able to overwhelm the U.S. forces by air as well as by sea. As such, holding Henderson Field was the most critical objective of the U.S. Navy and the Marines. Soon, Japan moved its superior fleets to the Santa Cruz Islands, hoping to lure the U.S. warships out once and for all. But despite being vastly outnumbered and having only two aircraft carriers, the U.S. fleet steamed ahead, knowing they had to protect the U.S. airfield at any cost. A massive clash ensued, one of the first and most violent carrier battles of the entire war. Deadlock. By October of 1942, the campaign in Guadalcanal was in a stalemate. Although the U.S. had successfully invaded the region, captured the airfield at Lungo Point, and renamed it Henderson Field, the Japanese naval and ground presence was alarmingly significant. After rehabilitating the airfield, the Allies gained air supremacy over the region despite having fewer aircraft carriers in the area compared to the enemy. Still, the Imperial Japanese Navy could operate almost without restrictions when U.S. warplanes became ineffective for combat during the night. This led to a gruesome war of attrition, with U.S. forces being supplied by air during the day and Japanese troops receiving resources by sea during the night in what would be known as the Tokyo Express. Both factions could do very little to disrupt the other's supplies. The strategy for the Imperial Japanese Navy called to recapture Henderson Field, but they attempted several assaults and were repelled each time. However, when the Imperial forces severely damaged the USS Enterprise carrier and left the US Navy with only one operational carrier in the region, they saw an opportunity. From October 20th to 25th, the Japanese launched a large-scale offensive to recapture the airfield with the Imperial Navy mistakenly assuming that the airbase had been captured and swiftly moving into position to help the troops hold the prized location. However, the attack was soon neutralized by the U.S. Marines, and when the Japanese realized the land troops had been defeated, the Imperial fleets decided to stick around to try and lure the weakened U.S. warships into battle. Destroying them would make the recapture of the Guadalcanal airfield much more manageable. The Return of USS Enterprise USS Enterprise had barely escaped total destruction during the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, and it was evident that it would take several months for the carrier to return to the South Pacific. Still, US Navy authorities ordered an expedited repair process after realizing she was desperately needed in the Guadalcanal campaign. Repairs were finished in record time, approximately one month, and Enterprise was soon sailing back with Air Group 10, the so-called Grim Reapers, commanded by James H. Flatley. Enterprise was instructed to rendezvous with USS Hornet, the other American carrier operating in Guadalcanal. Once in position, the carriers assembled into two task forces, making up a total of two fleet carriers, one battleship, three heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, 12 destroyers, and 136 aircraft. The fleet then moved towards the Santa Cruz Islands on October 25th, under the overall command of Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid. Meanwhile, now knowing that Enterprise was back in action, the Japanese were also ordered to approach the Santa Cruz Islands, eager to lure the U.S. warships and eliminate them before they could be reinforced. The Japanese fleet was divided into three groups, with a total of two fleet carriers, two light carriers, four battleships, eight heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, 24 destroyers, and 199 aircraft. After almost being destroyed once, 
USS Enterprise was about to face her most challenging confrontation yet. Seaborne Encounter The Americans were the first to spot the opposing force when PBY Catalina located the main Japanese force on October 25th at 11 p.m. Kincaid knew they were outnumbered, but he was confident they could take advantage of the element of surprise. The U.S. carriers immediately launched a strike force of 23 aircraft to deliver an initial attack. However, the Japanese were cautious and knew they'd been spotted, but they had no idea where the U.S. carriers were located. As such, they decided to move north at top speed, keeping their ships away from the American carrier's range. Soon after, the 23 American warplanes returned to their carriers, having made no contact. The opposing fleets finally located each other the following day. The U.S. forces spotted the enemy first, but a communication mishap gave a 20-minute advantage to the Japanese strike force, which was launched quicker. 21 Aichi D-3A-2 dive bombers, 20 Nakajima B-5N-2 torpedo bombers, 26 A-6M-3-0 fighters, and two additional Nakajima B-5N-2 then rushed towards USS Hornet. Meanwhile, only two American SBD-3 Dauntless scout aircraft had approached the enemy's location. Still, they managed to engage the Zuiho carrier, dropping 500-pound bombs and preventing the crew from using the flight deck. By 8 a.m., both sides were launching one strike group after another, and 40 minutes later, the opposing aircraft formations passed within sight of each other. Lieutenant Zuiho's Zeros surprised and attacked the Grim Reapers as they climbed, blinded by the sun. A series of dogfights then ensued, and four Zeros, three Wildcats, and two US TBFs were destroyed, with another two TBFs and a Wildcat forced to withdraw with severe damage. End of Hornet As the battle continued and chaos reigned, one of the Japanese strike forces located the USS Hornet task group. Three minutes later, the US ships detected the incoming Japanese attackers and immediately deployed 37 Wildcats. However, a series of communication errors and flawed control procedures led to an unsuccessful engagement. The disastrous error resulted in 20 Japanese torpedo warplanes and 16 dive bombers approaching Hornet unopposed. Moreover, at 9.12 a.m., a dive bomber delivered its 250kg semi-armor-piercing bomb right into Hornet's flight deck, taking the lives of 60 men. Seconds later, a 242kg high-explosive land bomb struck the flight deck, detonating and carving an 11-foot hole while taking another 30 sailors with it. A third warhead then hit Hornet, near where the first bomb hit, piercing three decks before exploding and causing even further damage to the already ravaged ship. As Hornet and her escorts unleashed all their anti-aircraft fire on the attackers, they were unable to prevent some of them from slipping in. At 9.14 a.m., a Japanese dive bomber was set on fire by Hornet's anti-aircraft guns, but the pilot decided to crash his plane into the carrier, causing severe damage. A minute later, Japanese torpedo bombers pierced the perimeter and placed two torpedoes in Hornet's side, knocking out her engines. As the carrier stopped, another Japanese dive bomber crashed his plane into Hornet and spread large amounts of aviation fuel, causing another massive fire. In the end, 25 Japanese aircraft were destroyed during the attack, and the surviving ones soon flew back to their carriers. Meanwhile, significant firefighting efforts were put into action and the fires in the ship were under control by 10 a.m. Still, the carrier was dead in the water. The load of the entire battle now rested on the shoulders of USS Enterprise. Enterprise vs. Japan With no more friendly carriers nearby, USS Enterprise now faced the might of the Imperial Japanese forces by herself. She had many escorts by her side, but the help they could bring was limited. The situation was critical. The carrier's flight deck was packed, there were still tens of American planes in the air, and another Japanese strike group was inbound. Moreover, as they began to run out of fuel, 
the pilots started to ditch their warplanes in the ocean, and the fleet's escort scrambled to pull them out from the sea. At 10.10 a.m., a Japanese strike group arrived on the scene. The crew aboard Enterprise quickly unleashed more anti-aircraft fire, taking several Japanese warplanes out of the sky. A few minutes later, another strike group descended from the clouds. This one led by Lieutenant Keiichi Yurima. Two 250-kilogram semi-armor-piercing bombs then found their target, punching two holes in the carrier's deck and severely damaging the forward elevator. Still, the Japanese didn't go out unscathed, losing 10 out of the 19 warplanes from the strike group. Before the crew could catch its breath, 16 Zuikaku torpedo planes arrived and split up to attack Enterprise. Several Zuikakus were taken out of the sky by anti-aircraft fire, but the ones that survived assaulted Enterprise, South Dakota, and the cruiser of Portland. The U.S. ships continually executed aggressive evasive maneuvers, masterfully dodging the incoming torpedoes. Enterprise stood out among them, as she used sharp turns to avoid nine torpedoes, while the crew stared in disbelief at the torpedo wakes passing them by. Nine out of the 16 torpedo planes were destroyed. Endgame. The situation grew more dire as more U.S. planes made their way back to the fleet with no place to land. Enterprise then reopened her flight deck to start landing aircraft, but another Japanese strike group soon appeared on the horizon. At 11.21 a.m., the Junyo carrier aircraft dove for an attack on the already damaged Enterprise, but the enemy didn't land any direct hits. Still, an immediate impact caused additional damage to the carrier's systems. After the last attack, with Hornet out of action, Enterprise heavily damaged, and the Japanese presumed to have one or two unharmed carriers in the area, Kincaid decided to withdraw. As Enterprise managed to recover 57 of the 73 U.S. aircraft still in the sky, Hornet was partially repaired on the spot. The light cruiser USS Northampton helped tow her away from the battle, but a sudden Japanese attack landed one more torpedo on the doomed carrier, undoing all the repairs. The crew was soon ordered to abandon the ship, and Japanese strike groups continued to drop bombs on top of her. As reports of Japanese ships drawing close to the disabled carrier arrived, the USS Mustin and Anderson destroyers were ordered to scuttle her. However, the Japanese destroyers Makigumo and Akigumo torpedoed Hornet until she finally dropped. Aftermath It all seemed to point towards an overwhelming Japanese victory, but as Japanese officers awaited the return of their pilots, the cost of their attacks began to dawn on them. Lieutenant Commander Masataka Okumiya, Junyo's air staff officer, later talked about the moment they realized the losses they had endured. Quote, We searched the sky with apprehension. There were only a few planes in the air in comparison with the numbers launched several hours before. The planes lurched and staggered onto the deck, every single fighter and bomber bullet holed. As the pilots climbed wearily from their cramped cockpits, they told of unbelievable opposition, of skies choked with anti-aircraft shell bursts and tracers. Tactically, the battle had been a victory for Japan, with their forces destroying one of the only two U.S. carriers in the region and damaging the other. Nevertheless, the event was a strategic defeat for the Japanese forces, losing half of their seaborne aircraft and 148 pilots. Some of them were among the most skilled airmen in Japanese military service. Meanwhile, the U.S., having lost only 26 pilots, was now in a much better position to claim air supremacy over Guadalcanal. In addition, the U.S. did not sink any Japanese carriers and managed to damage two of them. Enterprise was hastily patched up and returned to service, as the damaged ship was now the only thing that stood between the Junyo and Zuikaku carriers and their fleets. The scene was soon depicted by a sign on the Enterprise's deck that read Enterprise vs. Japan. Japan soon recalled Zuikaku, leaving the Guadalcanal campaign in a stalemate again. Thank you for watching our video. If you enjoyed the story, click on your screen and check out another of our Doc Documentaries channels 
where we delve into the most fascinating military events and the incredible technology that made them possible. Stay tuned.